So I'm going to give you a little quote. I'm going to exclude the first line because it kind of gives you a little bit of this. But after I get into it, I want you to just shout out who this is. Which one you, which once you know, shout it out. I'll keep going. For you. It's like uh, you just kill out trees. This is uh, a piece of writing. He talks a great deal and brags indeed of a muscular punch, punch that's incredibly speedy. The fistic world was dull and weary, with a champ like list and things had to be dreary. Then someone with color, someone with dash, brought fight fans running with cash. This brash young boxer is something to see, and the heavyweight champion is his destiny. This kid fights great. He's got speed and endurance. But if you if you sign to fight him, increase your insurance. This kid's got a left. This kid's got a right. If he hits you once, you're asleep for the night. And as you lie on the floor while the roofs while the refs count ten, you pray that you won't have to fight me again. For I am the man this poem is about. The next champ of the world. There isn't a doubt. If Cassius says a cow can lay an egg, don't ask, don't ask how, grease that skillet. He is the greatest when I say two, there's never a third. Betting against me is completely absurd. When Cassius says a mouse can outrun a horse, don't ask how, put your money where your mouse is. I am the greatest. So yes, of course, Muhammad Ali, it starts out. By Cassius Clay, this is the legend of Cassius Clay, the most beautiful fighter in the world today. That's how he starts it. There's an iconic poster of him, and it might be in that fight with Liston, I don't know. But it's him in the ring hovering over the knockdown opponent. And I am the greatest is typically the thing that's said there. Now last week I started with a boxing thought, right, throwing in the towel, and I find myself stuck in boxing apparently, and I don't like boxing in per se. I just, I found it interesting when I thought about this scripture of all the sports, of all the people that we can think of in our culture, in our world, that are braggadocious, so to speak. And I thought of football players and basketball players for sure. Oddly enough, I didn't think of many, I don't know, not many baseball players that make that list even though they're there. They don't really talk the kind of trash that basketball and football players do. I can think of a couple years ago, a guy on, uh, in the Super Bowl yelling at a reporter about Crabtree running his mouth. You guys remember this one? And, I mean, the braggadocious element of football and basketball is, is out there. But boxing is definitely on the tip of all of that because it's a singular person. And Muhammad Ali may in fact be the greatest. But did he have to say it? <laughs> We think it's funny to hear his words, don't we? It is, it is comical to think of a person that is this full of himself and proud and to be matched with the kind of dominance that helps him to justify it makes it all the sadder in a sense. Our scripture lesson today is the parable right after what we went through last week, where we were encouraged to not throw in the towel. Basically, to remember that God is in our corner, that He's going to step in and win the fight for us. Right? When we think of the, the lack of justice that the widow had with the unjust judge, and then begin to understand that God Himself does not require us to be persistent, squeaking wheels that are bothersome, but that God loves us. We are His chosen, His adopted ones, His loved ones. He wants to be there for us, but there's a plan, there's a purpose. But that imbalance 
that's in this life that creates that tension now sets up what we look at today as Jesus goes right into the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. The Pharisee, of course, looks at himself in the temple and says, I am the greatest. I mean, he would make up a rhyme that could match Muhammad Ali's. Actually, I'm not sure that that's possible. Muhammad Ali had the greatest flair. He was, this guy was something, right? The Pharisee, even in his conversation with God, thanked God that he was not that tax collector. The tax collector in that day would have been despised by culture despised by Pharisees and all of those that were following the Judaic code. All those that would have been in that culture would have despised what that tax collector did and how they made a living. The tax collector, on the other hand, did not say, I am the greatest. What did he do? Be himself. Uh, 
is it good? Well, no, it's not really good. Is it useful? Well, no, it's not really useful. Then it doesn't pass the test. Is it true, good, and useful? Is a good way for us to think too about what we talk about with others, and what we talk about with others is a good demonstration of what we will talk about with God. So, this Pharisee talked about the tax collector. He thought himself higher, better. How we talk and think about ourselves and others makes all the difference. In that last sentence that Jesus gives, it is the difference. For, he starts that out, for, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. How we talk about ourselves and others makes all the difference. The proud trust in themselves. This is clear from that scripture. And the humble trust in God. Paul is a beautiful example, biblically, of this. Ephesians chapter 3 is a perfect example. I, Paul, a, what does he say, Vince? How does he start that out? Ooh, a prisoner, yes. Prisoner. He goes on to talk about himself, the least among the saints. He talks about himself in a way that makes you understand that he does not think that he has it all together because he knows that he, in his success, is tapping into God's power. And that's really a great point to understand in just, juxtaposition to the widow and the unjust judge. It's not our strength and power. It's not our working. It's not our clever words. It's not our character or qualities that makes the difference. It's understanding that it's God that makes that difference. The great thing is that anyone can be humble. We all have that opportunity. How many of you succeed at that. You just failed. That's, I always go there. Whenever I talk about humility, right, it's that, that really strange space where if you achieved it and you recognize it, you've lost it. But here's what we can know for sure. Anyone can be humble and we need to recognize that God is the one that knows who you are. Because in a real world scenario when we're talking about how we talk about ourselves and being humble, where does that actually become difficult? When you're being accused. When you're being talked badly against. And you feel the need to step in and defend yourself. I would think that Jesus would remind us today to recognize that we're always in need of mercy. That we are sinners. Just like the tax collector declared. So the challenge though, when others are bringing these things against us and dressing us down, bringing us down, talking down about us. When we have Muhammad Ali there, I get it, we're facing Muhammad Ali and he, we're Sonny Liston and he's dressing us down in the most eloquent way, writing it and making it funny and making it something to be laughed at. When we find ourselves in that position, it's difficult to not step in and to start to push back and puff ourselves up and pretend that we are somehow greater than we are because we know that even Muhammad Ali can get knocked out and lose fights. We, no matter how good we are, are sinners. When the enemy attacks with the flare of Muhammad Ali, let someone else step in and defend. Let God step in.
Because those who judge are judged. We can continue to trust in who we are today. Yes, we are sinners. Saved, though, by the grace of God. We are God's children. We can stand firm in knowing that as our defense, as our position, as our posture. And that's the last thing that I will encourage us in today, is that our posture matters. Psychologists today will talk about the value of having good life posture. Standing strong is a phrase we use. We can stand strong, but we have to stand strong like Paul, a slave to God, a bond servant to God, a prisoner of the Lord, a servant of God. Strong, no doubt, but only with God's power. Verse 9 of that intro said, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Let's be those who trust not in ourselves but in God and regard others with grace and mercy with the eyes that God sees them with. So our posture can be strong in the power and strength that God gives. Amen.